So when I was a kid, I was super into fairies. Arguably, I still am. And it just so happens that around that time, Disney was turning Tinkerbell into her own, like, multimedia franchise. And there were a ton of books. And I ended up owning all of the books. <laughs> but then when I got to middle school, I was like, I'm too mature for fairies. I'm only into Doctor Who and Sherlock. So I gave all the books to my younger cousin, but now she's in middle school. And so she gave the books back to me. So now I have all them in my possession. And I thought, you know, it would be fun is if I reread all of the books. Uh, so I did. And now I would like to talk about them with someone. And I guess that someone is you. Think of this as my uh, fairy book report. My fairy book report. Just like for context, I don't even know if I can lift all these up. We're gonna find out. Oh. So this is, this is the vibe. This is. <laughs> cool. Great, so glad that happened. So the book started out with a novel by Gail Carson Levine. That name is familiar. It's because she wrote a lot of children's books. I would say most notably the Ella Enchanted book. If you've seen the movie, very different from the movie, much darker than the movie. And so these books are also quite dark. I remembered, but I didn't like fully remember how dark they were until I was reading them. And I was like, damn, these were for children. Here's the first one. It's called Fairy Dust and the Quest for the Egg. So here's sort of the setup. All of the fairies in Neverland live together in a place called Pixie Hollow. And they live together in this big hollowed out maple tree. They all have their little homes in there and they all work doing their own little tasks. Gail decided that fairy dust, pixie dust, comes from a magical bird named Mother Dove. So at one point, a long time in Neverland's history, there was a big fire, but then from that fire, Mother Dove was turned into a bird with magical properties. So when Mother Dove molts, like sheds all of her feathers, they take the feathers and like grind them up into pixie dust. And that's where pixie dust is from. Mother Dove also has an egg that she sits on and protects. It's like a magical egg that never hatches, that is the heart of magic in Neverland, I guess. I don't know how Gail came up with the bird thing, but it is a, a consistent through line in this series that the fairies all live together in Pixie Hollow and get pixie dust from the feathers of a bird named Mother Dove. So we got that. Okay. This book does not follow Tinkerbell as a main character. The main character is a fairy named Prilla, and she's a newborn fairy. The way that fairies are born is when a baby laughs for the first time, that laugh travels to Neverland and becomes a fairy. I believe the implication is that not every laugh turns into a fairy, otherwise that would be a lot of fairies. Only some laughs do. I'm pretty sure that's what we're saying. So Prilla is a newborn fairy and she comes to Pixie Hollow, but she's very abnormal because every Neverland fairy has a talent. And a talent is like their main passion and drive in life and what they spend most of their time doing, sort of their job also. So Tinkerbell, for example, is a Tinker Talent fairy. The talents really run the gamut from like really cool to really unappealing. <laughs> There's a lot of talents that are just like abstract nature concepts, like there's light talent fairies and water talent fairies. And then there's the talents that are just normal human jobs, like Tinkerbell being basically like a handyman repair person. There's cleaning talents and cooking talents, laundry talents. And the fairies with the lame talents aren't upset about it because that's the whole point of your talent is that you're very passionate about it and you enjoy it. So Prilla, she shows up in Pixie Hollow and she doesn't know what her talent is. And this is like unheard of. No one arrives and doesn't know immediately what talent they have. And there's discussion like, well, maybe 
Prilla is an incomplete fairy. Incomplete meaning that while the baby's laugh was traveling to Pixie Hollow, part of the laugh broke off. And so she's not complete. She's missing something. Which sort of makes me think of like a disability that it's meant to represent. I don't know. It's a little bit of a weird concept. I don't know if I love it. <laughs> so Prilla shows up to Neverland. Everyone thinks she's weird. But then, uh-oh, a hurricane suddenly hits Neverland. So now, gotta move on from the Prilla problem. We got bigger fish to fry. Fairies are very small. So they get like whapped around in the wind. And also, their wings are, like, very porous. So if they get their wings wet, then they can't fly because they're too heavy because they're, like, filled with water. So all these fairies are being whapped around by this hurricane. And meanwhile, Mother Dove's egg is destroyed. And Mother Dove is, like, quite seriously injured. I forget in what way. I think, like, her wing is broken or something. I don't know. And the fairies are brainstorming because if the egg is destroyed, then magic is going to stop working in Neverland. The whole island is going to be without magic now. So the fairies are brainstorming, how do we fix this egg? And they decide that since Mother Dove and her egg were sort of made magical by fire, maybe a magical fire could fix the egg. Sure. Okay. But where would we get magical fire. Well, there's an evil dragon named Kaito, and he's imprisoned on a mountain. I think it's Toth Mountain? I didn't write it down. So our big quest is we're gonna find some items to trade Kaito, because dragons like collecting rare items. We're gonna find some rare items and trade with Kaito for his services of breathing fire on the egg. And we send three fairies out on this quest. Prilla, even though she doesn't have her talent yet and she was quite literally born yesterday, Mother Dove thinks that she will be helpful on this quest. The next fairy is named Vidya. She is a fast flying talent and she's like the anti-hero fairy. She's so obsessed with flying fast, as fast as possible, that she once plucked some feathers from Mother Dove and ground it into her own extra powerful fairy dust. And so she was banished from the home tree and she's not allowed to see Mother Dove anymore. But since she is the fastest fairy, she might be useful on this quest. The last fairy is named Ronnie and she's a water talent fairy. So she can like manipulate water. When I was a child, I thought her name was Rainy. I thought her name was Rainy up until very recently, <laughs> up until like last week when I told my friend, oh, I'm reading all the Pixie Hollow books. And she said something, 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 Ronnie. And I was like, what did you say? She was like, Ronnie? The, the name of the fairy, Ronnie? And I was like, ooh, <laughs> she's definitely right. Because <laughs> it's spelled Ronnie. But you can understand how I was associating she's a water talent fairy. Rain is water. So maybe her name is pronounced Rainy. And I've just been pronouncing it that way in my head for god like 15 years <laughs> so i'm gonna make a concerted effort to pronounce it ronnie because that is the correct pronunciation i like looked it up there was a disney fairy ad that i guess they played on like disney channel or something and they do pronounce her name ronnie so um how did you come up with the names for the other fairies well ronnie is my sister's name and it's also an anagram of rain and she's a water talent fairy so that that one was pretty easy. So Ronnie, Prilla, and Vidya are going to go on this quest, and they're going to collect three rare items to trade with Kaito. They get Captain Hook's cigar holder, so they have to, like, go into his quarters and steal it from him while he's sleeping. And they almost fall into the ocean, which would be catastrophic because the wings can't get wet. But Neverland itself has some level of inherent magic or consciousness and so neverland brings the beach closer to them so that instead of falling in the ocean they fall onto the beach very nice of neverland to do that meanwhile tinkerbell is keeping mother dove company and trying to sort of distract her from her injuries and so she's just like talking about whatever she can think of and she ends up telling mother dove about her time spent with peter pan so these books take place 
after Tinkerbell went and was friends with Peter Pan and went on adventures with him, Tinkerbell felt like she wasn't really appreciated. And so she left Peter Pan and came back to Pixie Hollow. And she also just feels very ashamed that she wasted all this time with him. Also, because Mother Dove's egg was destroyed, everyone on the island is now like rapidly aging. Because part of the Neverland magic is that you never grow old. Well, now Peter Pan's baby teeth are falling out of his head and Captain Hook like has arthritis now. I don't know. It's sort of like body horror. It's like, oh. The next idea that the questers have is to go get a feather from a golden hawk. The golden hawk is also kind of aging so its eyesight isn't as good and so they're able to sort of pluck a feather from him without getting eaten because hawks like to eat fairies but since this hawk was in a weakened state they were able to get away with it their next idea is to get a mermaid's comb now as i've mentioned several times at this point fairy wings can't get wet and mermaids live at the bottom of the ocean so they can't just like swim down and talk to the mermaids they try and communicate with the mermaids up on land but apparently mermaids are very selfish and self-absorbed and they're not very interested in talking to the fairies so finally ronnie is like okay cut my wings off so that i can then swim underwater and talk to the mermaids and get them to give me a comb because ronnie is a water talent fairy she's always wanted to swim so this is a choice that she's making out of desperation but also there is a silver lining in that she now gets to swim so Prilla cuts Ronnie's wings off. Vidya like can't look because her whole thing is flying. So it's upsetting to her to even watch. Then Ronnie goes down and gets a comb from a mermaid. But a mermaid is like, I want a magic wand. And Ronnie's like, we're not those types of fairies. We don't have magic wands. And the mermaid's like, whatever, just get one for me. And Ronnie's like, okay, because they're kind of on a time crunch. So like, whatever gets me the comb. Then meanwhile, a fox attacks Mother Dove. So now she's doing like even worse. Now she's like on death's door. So the questers, they're running out of pixie dust. So they make a pixie dust hot air balloon to try and like get the most bang for their buck dust wise. So they get to Kaito and he's willing to trade with them. But it turns out that the hawk feather flew out of the hot air balloon because they didn't like hold it down or anything. And it's just a feather. So it just like blew away in the wind. And Kaito's like, well, I agree to three items. And it's like, if all magic ceases to work in Neverland, aren't you also screwed? So shouldn't you want to help them? No. But Ronnie's like, you can take my wings because they kept her wings after Prilla cut them off of her. And they sort of like crystallized. So Kaito breathes on the egg, but he like curses it somehow. I'm a little bit unclear as to what the curse is, but he like fixes it wrong somehow. And now the questers need to get home, but they don't have any fairy dust. And so Vidya is like, I guess we can use some of my super secret extra powerful fairy dust. And Prilla's like, you've had this the whole time? I mean, good for Vidya for making the right decision in the 11th hour but we could have used this earlier. So they head back and Mother Dove can immediately tell that the egg is wrong in some way. But then Prilla magically transports herself to the human world. So she's been having these dreams and visions of human children throughout the whole book. And it turns out she's actually been magically traveling over to the mainland so quickly that it's like the blink of an eye. And she encourages children to clap. Sort of like the, the like clap if you believe in fairies that and it turns out that that's her talent a mainland blinking clapping talent fairy she's the only one of that talent and with the children's clapping and belief the egg is restored and mother dove is healed and everything is good again and mother dove is like hey ronnie since you lost your wings this other bird named brother dove will fly you around so you can just whistle and he'll come and fly you wherever you need to go so it's like having wings i would argue it's sort of like a mobility aid which is cool so that's the first book that's what sort of kick-started the whole series it was published in 2006 and gail carson levine ended up writing two more books in this series they came out later so the next one came out in 2007 and the last one came out in 2010 and there were other 
non-Gail Carson Levine books sort of in between those. But just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to talk about the other two Gail Carson Levine books now. So the next Gail Carson Levine book is Fairy Haven and the Quest for the Wand. If you remember, in order to get the mermaid's comb, Ronnie promised that she would get the mermaids a magical wand. And obviously, the Never Fairies don't have magic wands, so she has not done that yet. And the mermaids are getting really upset that they don't have a wand. I say mermaids, plural. It's really one main mermaid. Her name is Soup, and she threatens to flood Pixie Hollow because she's so upset. So Ronnie's like, we have to go get a wand or this mermaid is going to kill us. So it's time for another quest. We're going to go see the great wanded fairies who are a different type of fairies. They're more like human sized and they use magic wands. Ronnie is going to go and Tinkerbell is going to go. And the fairy queen, who's named Queen Clarion, she's going to go with them. And Mother Dove is like, okay, but be careful because magic wands can cause wand madness where like you go crazy with the power of being able to wish for anything that you want that you can't sort of think straight. So our quest fairies agree to only make one wish each. So they go to the great wanded fairies and they're like, well, only we can control the wands because they're our wands. But if you want, we can give you a sleeping wand and anyone can control a sleeping wand, but you can't undo the wishes. So once you make a wish with a sleeping wand, it's permanent because since the wand is asleep, it's like too complicated for it to figure out how to undo it, I think. So they get a sleeping wand and they head home with the wand. And everyone immediately gets wand madness and they all start wishing for things. Ronnie wishes for the mermaid to be friends with her and then also wishes to have wings so that she can help pull the fairy dust balloon carrier. And then Queen Clarion wishes to shrink all of the hawks in Neverland because hawks eat fairies. She's like, as queen, I want all of my fairies to be protected. So what if we just eliminate the hawk threat? And Tinkerbell wishes for Peter Pan to fall in love with a seashell because she's like still mad at him because he sort of took her for granted. Meanwhile, Prilla is blinking over to the mainland and she meets Sarah Quirtle. Sarah Quirtle is the baby who laughed and that laugh turned into Prilla. So like Prilla is from Sarah Quirtle's laugh. And it turns out that the reason that Prilla is the way that she is is because an extra piece of Sarah Quirtle traveled along with the laugh and turned into Prilla. So Sarah Quirtle is a little bit incomplete and Prilla is like over complete. She's like a little more. And Prilla feels bad that she's sort of the reason that this little girl is depressed. I don't know what's wrong with Sarah Quirtle, but something's wrong with her. <laughs> and later Prilla runs into the questers with the magic wand and Prilla wishes for Sarah Quirtle to be complete. Then this guy, Terence, he's a boy fairy. Boy fairies in the Pixie Hollow world are called Sparrow Men. And he has a crush on Tinkerbell that is unreciprocated. <laughs> And so he wishes that Tink would like him romantically. Then Vidya comes to them and takes the wand from the balloon carrier while they're all like distracted with their wishes and whatnot. She wishes that she could be as fast as possible, like the fastest thing. But then flying isn't really that exciting anymore because there's no like reward. She can just be as fast as light. So then she brings the wand back to the questers and she's like, fix this. Cause she can't undo it because the wand is asleep. So she can't undo the wish, but she doesn't know that. So she's like, there must be something I'm missing. They'll know how to reverse the wish. And they lie to her. They're like, yeah, we can help you. Just give us the wand back. And then Ronnie brings the mermaid the wand which she wished for the mermaid to be friends with her. So the mermaid, Soup, is like, oh, it's my friend Ronnie. Let me sing to her. But mermaid song is like dangerous. So it turns Ronnie into a bat. Also in this book, apparently bats are like very polite. So they speak in this like overly formal way. And there's a little bit of Ronnie's consciousness like in the bat's head. But she's like being kind of rude to the bat because obviously she's upset that she's trapped inside of a bat body. But the bat doesn't like that she's being rude. 
because bats are very polite. So the bat ignores her and doesn't want to help her. Meanwhile, which this part has stuck with me, this was like the only thing I remembered from this book, is that the mermaid soup has another mermaid friend named Pa, and they're very like on again, off again frenemies. And they start fighting over who gets to use the wand. And so Soup wishes that no one can hear Pa speak again because she doesn't want to have to listen to Pa whining about the wand. And then she also wishes that Pa can't write. And then later she feels bad and she tries to reverse the wish, but she can't. So then she's like, well, fair's fair. I guess I'll let you wish for whatever you want. And then Pa wishes that Soup can't hear or read. So now they like can't communicate with each other. And that was such a terrifying prospect to me as a child that it's like stuck with me all these years. Meanwhile, with the fairies, an animal talent named Beck helps them find Ronnie Bat. And they're able to convince the bat that probably it would be better if Rainy was herself again. And the bat's like, okay, how do, you, how do we fix this? And they're like, oh, we didn't get that far. We don't know. So they send Prilla to go make some children clap on the mainland. They're like, this usually fixes things. And it does. And so now Ronnie is like herself again with a tiny bit of bat consciousness. Then Ronnie goes and steals the wand back from the mermaids. Because they're like, we gotta undo these wishes. We need to get this wand back and we'll wake it up. So they steal the wand back from the mermaids. And then Tinkerbell is able to like fix the wand because she like fixes things. So she fixes the wand and everything is now back to normal. So the hawks are now normal size. Tink is no longer in love with Terrence. Uh, the one thing that the wand does decide is let's keep Sarah Quirtle complete. It doesn't make Sarah Quirtle incomplete again. So the wand is like, probably this was a good wish. And then the last book I had never read and I had to purchase it for this video. So I got it off of... Um, like thrift books or something. And it doesn't have a dust jacket, but it is called Fairies and the Quest for Neverland. It was published in 2010. And the book follows Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn is Wendy's great granddaughter, Wendy from Peter Pan. And all of Wendy's descendants get this necklace, which is the button that Peter Pan gave to Wendy. I didn't watch Peter Pan. I find him very annoying, and I was not going to watch Peter Pan just for the purposes of this video. So I don't really know the Peter Pan lore, but I guess there was a button that Peter Pan gave to Wendy, and so it's that button that has been cast in silver and put on a necklace. So Gwendolyn has this necklace, and it gives her visions of what's going on in Neverland. And so she gets a lot of visions of the fairies. And by watching these fairies, she sort of becomes infatuated with them. Like, she wants to meet them and spend time with them and be their friend. And apparently Peter Pan comes every however many years to bring Wendy's descendants to Neverland. So it's going to be Gwendolyn's turn to be brought to Neverland by Peter Pan. So she's like planning out her visit and like what she's going to bring the fairies as gifts and what she's going to say to them. So Peter Pan shows up and takes her to Neverland. And I find Peter Pan annoying. So all of the Peter Pan portions of this book, I'm like, oh my God. But Gwendolyn is immediately like, okay, bye Peter. I'm going to go find the fairies. Because <laughs> Peter Pan was expecting her to like, do the lost boys laundry and like cook for them and Gwendolyn's like uh no so she goes and finds the fairies and they have some like human fairy cultural misunderstandings but they sort of warm up to her Vidya is the first to approach her Vidya is like okay hold me in your hand and like throw me as hard as you can because her whole thing is that she wants to fly as fast as possible she's like mm, free accelerant Mother Dove is not a fan of Gwendolyn. She's worried that Gwendolyn is going to accidentally harm the fairies. But even though Mother Dove is wary of her, she's allowed to stay with them. And the fairies make her a bedroom in the forest and they cook human-sized food for her. And they're all starting to bond. Meanwhile, the dragon Kaito is released from his prison by these creatures called Tiffins. 
we don't get that much Tiffin lore. I would like sort of expanded information about Tiffins. And they send Vidya to go check on Kaito because she's the fastest flyer. But then she like falls in love with him because they like relate to each other or something. I don't know. Meanwhile, all the fairies and Gwendolyn are trying to like plan how they're going to recapture Kaito. So they plan to trap him in a collar attached to a chain and then attach that chain to like a boulder. And so they're melting down all of the metal in Pixie Hollow to make this collar. And Tinkerbell is like working overtime. All of the like sewing and art talent fairies make this like fabric decoy dragon to like maybe distract him. And the water fairies are going to fly birds made of water because Kaito obviously could breathe fire on them. So they want to have water like on standby to like extinguish any fires. So they're as prepared as they can be and they go to fight Kaito and he like kills I think like seven fairies. There's a lot more fairy death in these books than I remembered there being. I don't think I've mentioned that sometimes fairies will die of disbelief and like disappear just interesting that gail carson levine has no issue killing off fairies gwendolyn is there for this fight but she like panics she's afraid of more fairies getting killed so she starts to, like stuff fairies into her backpack hoping that she'll be able to save at least a couple fairies and in these books fairies are able to communicate with children. They can't talk to adults, but they can talk to children. But Gwendolyn was warned that if she harms any fairies, then Neverland, the sentient island itself, will sort of retract that ability and then she won't be able to communicate with them. So while stuffing fairies into her backpack, she accidentally squishes one and now she can't communicate with the fairies. And she can't tell how the fight is going. And she's like, oh my god, I need to fix this. I need to stop Kaito. And she realizes that the key to all this is Vidya. So she grabs Vidya and she threatens to squish her. And Vidya could escape, like could fly away. Like Gwendolyn isn't holding her that tight. But she stays and she pretends that she's being hurt by Gwendolyn in order to distract Kaito long enough for the fairies to put the collar on him and trap him. During this whole fight, Gwendolyn was in fire for a little bit and her like button necklace is like melted. So now she won't have any visions of Neverland anymore. But she's saved the day and Neverland gives her back the ability to hear fairies and they're all very kind and thankful. And then she has to return home, but Prilla visits her because Prilla can travel between Neverland and the mainland and gives Gwendolyn a necklace that Tinkerbell made for her. And Gwendolyn's thrilled. She's like, this is way more special since a fairy made it for me. This book was interesting. I mean, it was my first time reading it. And I find it interesting that I think adults think for some reason that children want to be friends with fairies, when I do not think that is the case. I wanted to be a fairy. I wanted to live in a little miniature diorama and have dresses made out of flower petals and be able to fly. I was not like, my greatest fantasy is that Tinkerbell will make a necklace for me. But I think part of it is that Gail Carson Levine wanted to go to Neverland as a child. Well, my parents were great about making sure we had reading. And uh, I fell in love with Peter. I wanted to marry Peter. I thought Wendy was an idiot for going home. So maybe she wrote it this way because that's what she fantasized about. But it's a wish fulfillment fantasy that I do not relate to. Another thing that I want to mention about these books is their illustrations. Hopefully, depending on how editing has gone, I've been putting them up on the screen. They are by an artist named David Christiana and they're so interesting these like dark moody watercolor illustrations I don't know how Disney decided that that's the direction they wanted to go for these Gail Carson Levine books but I think they're so cool then we have all of these chapter books which since I dropped them they're all like out of order <laughs> oh. I do not technically own all of them so there were a couple that were published after I had stopped collecting them, but it's only like a few. These are very much what you would expect if I told you there's a book series about Tinkerbell and all her friends. 
The Gail Carson Levine books are a lot darker and weirder than I think you would expect from the phrase Tinkerbell books, but these are much more like straightforward Tinkerbell and her friends chapter books. I would also like to mention these books have a completely different art style, which is sort of the art style that they ran with for a lot of the merchandise and stuff. And I just love this art style. I think it's so cute. I'm hopefully going to be putting images from these books up on screen so you can appreciate the illustrations. First one is called The Trouble with Tink. The Trouble with Tink is about Tink losing her hammer, her hammer that she uses to fix things. Terrence invites her to go play a game of fairy tag and during the game she like drops it somewhere and then she can't find it. She has a backup hammer, but the backup hammer is at Peter Pan's hideout. She left it there and she's been too nervous to go back. She doesn't want to confront Peter Pan. So she tries to use other tools instead of her hammer, but everything she fixes turns out terribly. Like she fixes a pan and now everything the pan makes is ruined. And we're like, oh no, has Tinkerbell lost her talent? This is kind of a theme in these books of like something goes wrong, the fairy can't perform their talent or they're like having trouble. And now there's like this existential anxiety that like, if I don't have my talent, then who am I? It sort of makes the talent system seem unappealing because I don't know if it's a good idea to have your identity so tied to like one thing. If say you lose your tinker's hammer, now your life is ruined. So Tinkerbell, since she's so worried that she can't fix anything, she's like, well, let's go get my backup hammer. And Terrence offers to come with her. She has like a conversation with Peter Pan. I don't care because I find him annoying, but she gets her backup hammer and she's able to fix something properly. It's like the queen's bathtub. She like fixes it perfectly. The next book is Vidya and the Fairy Crown. It's the queen's arrival day. An arrival day is just like a birthday. It's like when the laugh came to Pixie Hollow and turned into the fairy. So it's the queen's arrival day and there's gonna be a big party. And Vidya says to Tinkerbell and Ronnie, they're like, are you even going to the party? And she's like, that's what I'd call a waste of a perfectly good evening. Unless you need someone to fly in and snatch that crown off of Queen Ree's head. And then of course, the crown goes missing and everyone's like, well, it must've been Vidya but it wasn't Vidya. And so Prilla offers to help Vidya clear her name because since they went on the quests together, they're like sort of friends. And they do some detective work and trace sort of the trajectory of where the crown ended up. One of the queen attendant fairies took the crown to the crown repair fairy, but it was like in a pouch. And so the laundry fairy thought it was laundry and then took it to the laundry room. But then when another fairy found the crown in it, they like set it aside. And then a party setup fairy found the crown, but they were gonna have a bunch of replica crowns for the party. So they thought, oh, this is just another replica crown and threw it in the giant room of replica crowns. So they have to go through each of the crowns one by one because the only difference between the real crown and the fake crowns is that the real crown will like shrink or grow to the size of your head when you say pixie hollow mother dove the world we cherish the one we love so you have to say that each time for each crown they like stay up all night Prilla and Vidya trying to find the crown and Vidya finds it and for a moment she thinks well maybe I should just keep it because everyone already thinks I stole it but then she decides to do the right thing Next is Beck and the Great Berry Battle. Beck is a very minor character in the Gail Carson Levine books. And she's one of the characters who is exclusive to this book series and is extremely boring. It's her and like two other characters where they're nice and want to do the right thing. And they're really passionate about their talent. And that's like nothing. <laughs> that's not, that's nothing. That's like every fairy. So I don't really like Beck because I don't think she is very interesting. Oh, also Beck is like an animal talent fairy. So she like takes care of Mother Dove and she can communicate with animals. So in this book, the animals are all upset with each other. They've gotten into a disagreement and all the animals are like taking sides and they start throwing berries at each other. So all the fairies are getting like berry juice on their wings. And no one wants to go outside. 
but then two baby animals from either side of the conflict are like almost attacked by a hawk. So everyone kind of works together to save them. And this has made them realize like maybe this disagreement wasn't that big of a deal. The disagreement was over a bird's nest that went missing and the birds thought that it was stolen. But then it turns out that senile old grandfather mole took it and has been wearing it as a hat. So disagreement solved. The next one is Lily's pesky plant. Lily is another one of the boring characters. She's a garden talent fairy, so she can like grow plants and she's nice and tries to do the right thing. She's very passionate about gardening. In this one, she finds a seed in the woods and she plants it in her garden and it's the like worst seed in the world. It smells bad, it attracts wasps, gets pollen everywhere, fairies get stuck in the sap. Everyone wants her to cut the plant down but she really loves plants. She's like, I don't want to. The plant deserves to live. But then it bears fruit and it's this like really spectacular fruit where like if you pick one, another one grows right back in its place. And there's another garden talent fairy named Iris who like knows about every single plant. She like keeps notes about plants. She doesn't really have her own garden, but she researches plants. And Iris is like, oh, it's an ever tree. They're very rare. This might be the only one left in all of Neverland. And so all the fairies are now happy to have this tree and they're all excited about using the fruit. The next one is called Ronnie and the Mermaid Lagoon. There's gonna be a fairy dance. There's a lot of fairy events at any given time in Pixie Hollow. And the water talent fairies are gonna do like a water fountain dance where they're gonna like fly around and control the water. But Ronnie can't, cause she can't fly. And Brother Dove is too big. He like can't fly in formation with the other fairies. And so Ronnie feels like an outsider because she can't practice her talent. So she runs away and meets some mermaids. And she's sort of like, their pet, like they don't really respect her. They just sort of like dress her up and ignore her. And then Ronnie goes off and she helps a trapped seahorse. And then she gets a message from Tinkerbell that's like, please come back, we miss you. So then she does come back and they find some way for her to participate in the fountain thing. She like gets a part at the beginning. Next one is called Fira and the Full Moon. Fira is a book only character. She has slightly more personality in that she's like a little bit anxious and sort of type A, but you could argue that's just the circumstances of this specific book that's making her sort of stressed out. Fira is a light talent fairy and usually fairies use fireflies to like light things up for them when it's nighttime, but all of the fireflies have gotten sick with firefly, f with firefly flu tongue twister. So the light talents are working overtime to help everyone see where they're going and light things up. But then three light talent fairies arrive, all three of them from the same laugh, I think. I don't think it's three separate laughs. I think it's all from the same laugh, like they're triplets. And they're really annoying. <laughs> they're like getting in the way and like fighting with each other all the time. And Fira's like, I have to go help the mining fairies light up the mines. You guys just stay out of trouble. But then Fira is so overworked that her light completely flickers out. And so now her and the mining talent fairies are like trapped in the mines. But then it turns out that the triplets have followed her and they're able to lead everyone out of the mines. The next one is a masterpiece for Bess. Bess is an art talent fairy. So she was always one of my favorites. Though one could argue that she is just nice and really passionate about art. In this book, she painted a portrait of Tinkerbell as a thank you because Tinkerbell like fixed her palette knife and now everyone wants a portrait and they're being really ungrateful about it. Because to be clear, these aren't like commissions because fairies have no form of currency. So Bess is painting these as a favor. And fairies are being like, hmm, is that really what my wings look like? Can you redo it, but different? And Bess realizes like, I don't wanna do all these portraits for people, I wanna do my own art. And so she does a painting of the windy forest, like all the leaves flying around and stuff. And Vidya really likes the painting because she loves wind and fast flying and air. So Bess gives Vidya the painting. 
And Bess sort of makes an announcement like, I'm just going to make the kind of art that I want to make. And everyone immediately moves on and they're no longer interested. And Bess feels a little sad because she did enjoy the attention. And another art talent fairy named Quill is like, remind me to tell you about the time a few years before you arrived when all the fairies decided they just had to have their very own tiny hand carved talent symbols to wear around their necks. And Bess is like, really? I don't think I've ever seen one. And Quill is like, exactly. People are very fickle and you can't take it personally. And Bess is like, oh, I got it. The next one is Prilla and the Butterfly Lie. Since Prilla has such a unique talent, she doesn't really have a talent group to hang out with. So she spends time with all the different talent groups and tries out their talents with them. And Vidya is like, it's stupid that you keep spending time doing things that aren't your talent. You should just be doing your talent. And Prilla does some caterpillar shearing. She doesn't like it, but she lies and says, oh, well, really, I prefer butterflies. And then one of the butterfly talent fairies is sick. So they're like, Prilla, you should fill in because you love butterflies. And Prilla's like, oh. So she has to like herd the butterflies and it turns out that butterflies are pranksters. So they keep playing tricks on her and she doesn't understand what's happening. And finally, one of them plays dead. And so Prilla thinks she killed a butterfly. She like goes sobbing to the queen like, I didn't mean to kill a butterfly. And everyone's like, no, they're just pranking you. It's just a prank, bro. It's just a butterfly prank. The next one is Tink North of Neverland. Tink gets a compass that washes up because sometimes items from the mainland wash up onto Neverland. And Terrence is like spending too much time with Tink and annoying her. And he accidentally breaks something and they fight about it and they're not friends anymore. And then Tink feels bad. She's like, oh, I probably should apologize. I sort of overreacted. And that night everyone goes to see a storyteller fairy who tells the tale of the pixie dust tree. So before there was Mother Dove, there was a giant tree that made pixie dust, but then it was destroyed in the fire. And that's when Mother Dove was born. And it's rumored that there's still a cloud of the original pixie dust from the pixie dust tree on the north side of Neverland. And Tink is like, perfect, I'll go get Terrence some of this pixie dust as an apology. I don't think I've mentioned Terrence is a pixie dust talent fairy, so he helps make the pixie dust and like give everyone their daily scoop of dust. So that's why Tink thinks that this would be a good present for him. And she goes on a quest with a hot air balloon and a compass and she doesn't find anything, but she comes back and apologizes to Terrence and they make up anyway. Uh, the next one is Beck Beyond the Sea. So I find these kind of quest books very boring. The Gail Carson Levine quest books are like complicated. There's a lot of interpersonal stuff going on. This is the kind of quest where it's just like, we're coming upon small obstacles, but nothing that interesting is happening. So I um, didn't really reread this one. I like skimmed through it and I was like, yep, not missing anything. The next one is Dulcie's Taste of Magic. Dulcie is a baking talent fairy, so she like bakes different things. And she's like the head baking fairy. She's sort of in charge. And there's a new baking talent fairy named Ginger who isn't very nice and sort of rattles Dulcie. So then Dulcie makes a mistake because she's sort of flustered. She like ruins the poppy seed muffins or something. And Queen Clarion is like, how about you take a few days off? Which no fairy ever wants to do because their talent is what they're very passionate about. So sometimes it'll be like, just take some time off. And they're like, no, I don't want to. So Dulcie goes to the library to like look at the cookbooks or something. And she finds this ancient recipe, but she's supposed to be resting. So she is going to have to get all the ingredients in secret. So she like follows all of the fairies who are in charge of collecting ingredients. Like she follows the egg collecting fairies and she like gets an egg. She's able to get all the ingredients and she bakes the cake. There are no instructions. So she has to just like wing it. And at first it seems like the cake didn't rise. And at this point, the other baking fairies have shown up for the morning and Ginger makes fun of her. Like, oh, your cake didn't rise. But then magically the cake expands into this like beautiful tall cake. The next one is Silver Mist and the Ladybug Curse. So at this point, the first Tinkerbell movie was about to come out. And a lot of the side characters in the movies were inspired by minor characters from the books. For example, the character Silvermist, who's a water talent fairy. 
She's in an illustration in Back in the Great Berry Battle, and she hangs out with Terence in Tink North of Neverland. And her design went unchanged from the illustrations of her in those books. In this book, she and some other fairies are like doing a boat outing or something and like taking fairies out on boats and Vidya is there. I don't know why Vidya would want to be there. And then Vidya falls into the water and like her wings get all soaked and she's super irritated and she blames Silvermist. She's like, this is all your fault. And then a white ladybug lands on Silvermist's head and Vidya's like, oh, that's bad luck. You're cursed now. So now everyone thinks she's cursed and Silvermist keeps making like mistakes. So she and her friend Fira research ways to break the curse. So they try like getting a feather from a swan and wishing on a star. None of it works. And then Silvermist has to compete in this water fairy tournament. It's one of the many whimsical activities that fairies partake in because they have a lot of free time. So she has to do this thing that's like archery, but like with water because they can like manipulate water. So she is meant to make like a ball of water and like shoot it at a target. Um, and she accidentally hits the queen in the face, <laughs> but everybody kind of laughs about it and she sort of calms down. And then on the ground, she finds a five leaf clover and Vidya is like, mm, that's not good enough to break the curse. And then Silvermist realizes, oh, this is all Vidya's fault. Like for making me think that I am cursed and thus I am acting as though I am cursed, right? Psychology. And then she's able on her next try to hit a bullseye with the water balloon. Good for her. The next book is Fawn and the Mysterious Trickster. Fawn is an animal talent fairy who became the movie character. She's all throughout Beck and the Great Berry Battle, and she's in the background of a lot of illustrations. She originally wore this light purple outfit, except in one illustration in a masterpiece for Bess where she wears this brown outfit. And then for the movie, she was redesigned to be wearing this sort of orange and brown thing. So in this book, Fawn loves pranks and practical jokes. I don't think that really comes up in the movies, but according to this book, she does. And someone keeps pranking Fawn. She keeps like waking up and like all of her furniture has been turned upside down and there's like slime everywhere. Turns out it's kiwi fruit jelly. One morning she wakes up and she's been moved in her sleep to the fairy kitchens. So her and her friend Beck set some traps to try and like find this person. And then of course it turns out it was Fawn sleepwalking the whole time. I feel like that's a very children's book ending. I don't know how much that happens in real life that someone is sleepwalking and causing mischief in their sleep. I don't know. If you sleepwalk and you think that is an accurate representation, please sound off in the comments. The next book is Rosetta's Daring Day. Rosetta is a garden talent fairy. She became a movie character and they made her outfit all pink. She hangs out with Terrence in Tink North of Neverland. And she's one of the fairies who requests a portrait from Bess. And she makes flower umbrellas in Beck and the Great Berry Battle. She's very like prim and proper and girly. So one day she's working in her garden and the squirrel keeps like bothering her. So she goes and gets an animal talent fairy. She gets Fawn to come and like see what's wrong with this squirrel. And apparently the squirrel was trying to tell her that there's a giant forest fire. So all the fairies go to put out this fire. But Rosetta doesn't join them because she's afraid of like getting dirty. And then there's going to be a banquet to thank all the fairies who put out the fire. But Fawn doesn't want to go. She doesn't want to get all dressed up. She doesn't want the attention. And Rosetta's like, you have to go. If you go, then I will do whatever you want for a day. So they make the deal and Rosetta gets Fawn all like dressed up. And they're both in these very beautiful gowns. And then everyone at the banquet is giving Fawn all this attention because Fawn never dresses up. And Rosetta's like kind of jealous. She's like, no one's complimenting me. So then the next day, Fawn has Rosetta put on a blindfold and guides her into the woods. Then they go frog jumping and Rosetta falls into the stream. And then they go strawberry picking and she falls into the mud. And she tells Fawn, like, I'm not having fun. I want to go home. And Fawn's upset because she thought, like, this is the stuff that she finds fun. And she wanted Rosetta to have a good time. And then this happens very quickly and it's sort of unclear as to like how this happens. But as they're walking home, Rosetta spots like a nest of baby owls and she like goes to show Rosetta and then she gets stuck in a hole 
I'm unclear as to like the progression of events. I feel like we needed more sentences, but Fawn is now stuck in a hole and there's a lot of worms in the hole and Fawn's chill. It doesn't bother her. She's like, Rosetta, I know that you won't want to help me out because it's like dirty and gross. So just go get another fairy to help me out. But then Rosetta's like, no, I want to do it. I want to like face my fear. So she helps Fawn out of the hole. And then later Fawn is having like lunch with the queen and they call Rosetta over and the queen is like, we're gonna have dinner in the courtyard tonight and it's gonna be dedicated to you for helping Fawn. And Rosetta's like, well, what I did wasn't that brave. And Fawn's like, no, it was brave for you because that's what you're afraid of. And we're all afraid of different things. I was afraid to go to the banquet. And so they've both faced their fears. The next one is Iridessa Lost at Sea. Iridessa is a light talent fairy from the movies. And she was only illustrated in Tink North of Neverland, where she wears this blue and yellow outfit. But she was redesigned to have an all yellow sunflower themed outfit. Iridessa almost gets attacked by an owl, but she like uses her light powers to like shine light in the owl's face and scare him off. And everyone was like, we need to do something about this owl. Iridessa, you're in charge of it. <laughs> you figure it out. And then Tinkerbell comes to help her because Tinkerbell's like an inventor. But they keep like butting heads, like they don't get along because they're both very strong personalities. Iridessa is very like type A leader, sort of anxious. Iridessa's idea is to put a bunch of light in a bottle and then just have this very bright bottle that'll scare the owl away. But they can't find a bottle big enough. Like they go to the bottle making fairies and they're like, this is the biggest one we have. So Tink suggests that they go steal a bottle from Captain Hook's ship. And Iridess is like, that's a terrible idea. But then Tink goes and does it anyway. So Iridess has to like come after her to save her. And Tink is like in the middle of picking up the bottle. But then they like hear the pirates nearby. So then they hide in the bottle and then Smee puts the cork in the bottle and then they're trapped in the bottle and then the bottle rolls out of a porthole into the ocean. So now they're trapped in a bottle in the ocean. Feels like a very contrived way to get us to that point. <laughs> and then they keep arguing about what to do. They get swallowed by a TikTok the crocodile then they turn the alarm on the clock that's in his stomach to like make him hiccup the bottle back up they run into some mermaids they're able to get on shore and they convince a crab to pull the cork out of the bottle so now they're free and then they turn the bottle into like a boat and then they sail back to pixie hollow and they get home and they use the bottle against the owl and it works great the next one is Queen Clarion's Secret. It's named Queen Clarion's Secret, but she is not the main character. It's like about her. So we're following Prilla, who's flying kites with the other fairies. And she spots Queen Clarion going into Lily's garden. And then she like disappears. And Prilla's like, where did the queen go? So then it's like a mission to track down the queen. So she talks to Lily and apparently this special seed from a rose is missing. And they think that maybe Queen Clarion took it, but they don't know why she would take it. They do a lot of searching and then they find the queen. Apparently Mother Dove had asked the queen to take this seed as a gift for the sky bird. The sky bird and Mother Dove were friends before Mother Dove became a magical bird with an egg. And the sky bird just like flies all around Neverland and he's like too big to land. Like if he would land, then he wouldn't be able to like get back in the air again. And so the seed, it's for the sky bird. And that's the resolution to that. The next one is Micah finds her way. Micah is a scout fairy. So she looks out for danger. Like if there's a hawk or an owl, or any other carnivorous birds. She's flying over a field of flowers and they all like puff pollen into her face. And then she thinks that there's a thunder cloud. So she calls all the fairies to hide in the home tree. And then she goes back out and there is no thunderstorm. It was just the pirates firing cannonballs. And it was like the smoke in the air. And everyone's like, huh, that's a pretty big mistake for you to make. And then later she thinks a tree branch is a snake. And throughout this, her vision is getting blurry, but she's keeping it a secret. So to everyone else, it just seems like she's really lost her talent and isn't able to spot danger anymore. So she's given all these menial tasks of like, find this needle that I lost. 
And Queen Clarion is like, maybe you should rest for a few days. So she's hanging out with Bess, the art talent fairy, and mentions the flowers that she flew over. And Bess is like, oh, I know those flowers. There's a painting of them in the gallery. So they get the painting. They take the painting over to a healing talent fairy because now they know it's probably these flowers. And the healing fairy looks it up. And she's like, you need this special moss from behind a waterfall, but it's very dangerous back there. And so then Micah and Bess go together. And even though Micah can't really see anymore, she uses all of her other scout talents to like and get them safely out. And then she wears the moss as like a compress overnight. She wakes up and she can see again. The next one is Lily in full bloom. Tinkerbell invents this like light reflecting hat and everyone's like oh that's so great and Tinkle's like yeah that's why tinkers are the most important talent because they invent things that help everyone else and all the other talents are like okay our talents are also important and we could invent things too so now all of the talents are trying to invent things like the laundry talents develop these like bleaching soap pellets. And Lily is trying to invent a new flower, a flower that can grow on any surface. So it doesn't have to be planted on the ground. It can just sprout anywhere because it's magic. She brings her first batch of seeds to like go and show the other fairies, but then it accidentally gets knocked into the well. So she makes a new version and then she's peer pressured into giving the seeds to all the other garden talent fairies. So now these flowers are everywhere. But then they start to lose their color. They're like turning black and white. And then the rest of Pixie Hollow starts to lose its color. And Lily's like, oh no, did my flowers cause this? But then a laundry talent fairy shows a blanket that is covered in flowers. So the flowers and the soap got swapped somehow. So Lily dropped the soap into the well. So it was a big switcheroo. And the water talent fairies are able to like clean out the well and fix everything. And there's sort of a message of like, all of the talents are interconnected and they're all important. The last physical one that I have is Vidya meets her match. A new fast flying fairy named Wisp arrives to Pixie Hollow and she's like super fast, like almost as fast as Vidya. And Mother Dove is sort of concerned that Wisp is like reckless. So she warns Wisp to be careful. Vidya challenges Wisp to a race because she wants to see if she's still the fastest fairy. And Vidya wins. So she's like, okay, I'm still the best, but she is the second best. So I guess we can be friends. And they start racing all over Pixie Hollow doing like increasingly dangerous races. They try to outrun a wave or outfly a wave, I suppose, which if the wave caught up to them, then their wings would be drenched and they would drown in the ocean. The lost boys are like firing their arrows around Neverland and Vidya and Wisp try to like outfly the arrows and then they go to race a hawk and Vidya ends up needing to use some of her extra special super secret mother dove pixie dust. She's like, Wisp is definitely a goner because if I had to use my extra special pixie dust, then she definitely would have been caught by the hawk. But then it turns out Wisp is alive. And Vidya's like, oh no, this means she is the fastest flyer because she was able to outrun the hawk without the super special, super secret mother dove pixie dust. But then it turns out that Wisp had stolen some of the extra special, super secret mother dove pixie dust. <laughs> and then Wisp goes out and there's been like a forest fire happening because of this like phoenix flower. And all of the fairies have been trying to like keep this fire from spreading. But Wisp like fans up the flames and then sort of gets trapped with fire all around her. And Vidya realizes, oh, she's just a reckless idiot. I don't have to compare myself to her. And so Vidya uses one of the animal talent fairy tunnels to like sneak in and save Wisp. And Wisp is like, oh my god, thank you so much for saving me. I owe you my life. And Vidya's like, your life? And what would I want with a silly thing like that? After all, you're just a foolish little fairy. And only the second best flyer in Pixie Hollow. Vidya gets the best lines. <laughs> so those are all of the chapter books that I physically have. But there were still a couple more released after I stopped collecting them. Some of them I was not able to find. But some of them my library had as like ebooks. Shout out to Libby. <laughs> so next was Four Clues for Ronnie. There was like a two week dry spell in Pixie Hollow. So it was tough on everyone, but it was especially tough on the water fairies. 
but now the dry spell seems to be over. And Queen Clarion is like, let's all take a day off and do a big scavenger hunt tomorrow. And so Ronnie goes to the library to, like, do research, which, like, kind of doesn't make sense because she doesn't know what any of the clues are. But she's just, like, reading in the hopes that something will be helpful. And then she falls asleep in the library. And by the time she wakes up, the scavenger hunt has basically already started. And everyone has already teamed up with someone. So she has to team up with Ronan, a polishing fairy, who's, like, very slow and purposeful. She's like, oh my god, this guy... She's also under the impression that Ronan pities her for not having wings because a lot of fairies make like comments about how they feel bad for Ronnie that she doesn't have wings anymore. And for some reason, Ronnie makes a bet with Vidya that she's going to win the scavenger hunt. And the bet is that if Vidya wins, then Ronnie has to do whatever Vidya wants for a day and vice versa. If Ronnie wins, then Vidya has to do whatever Ronnie wants. But like, why would you make that bet? This seems like a terrible idea. But Ronnie and Ronan actually work really well together. They're able to solve the clues and they take their time because Ronan is slow and they have a conversation and Ronan is like, oh no, I don't feel bad for you that you don't have wings. I felt bad that you were a water fairy during the dry spell. And Ronnie's like, oh, that makes sense. Okay. And the last task of the scavenger hunt is you have to go up to Queen Clarion and say a phrase. And all of the other fairies have been saying the wrong phrase because they use like the wrong clue. I don't feel like explaining it more than that. But Ronan and Ronnie say the right phrase because Ronnie read that phrase last night in the library. And so they've won the whole scavenger hunt. And now Vidya has to do whatever Ronnie wants for like, was it a week? It might have been a week. I didn't write it down. The next one is Trill changes her tune. Trill is a very shy music talent fairy. She wants to experiment more with musical instruments. Like she wants to create new instruments and try different ways of doing things. But the head of the music talents, his name is Clef, and he's very traditionalist. Like he doesn't want to try anything new. They play like the same songs at every concert. And Trill speaks up one day and she's like, I think we should try new things. And she kind of creates a schism in the music talent. Like now half of the fairies want to follow Clef and do the same thing that they've always done and half the fairies want to experiment and try new things. And so they're going to play this ocean symphony and Trill and all of the people who support experimentation all come in with like newfangled instruments. And all of the music talent fairies on either side of the argument all play this symphony together and it sounds great. And they agree that maybe sometimes experimentation is a good thing. The next one is Art Lessons by Bess. There's a new art talent fairy who arrives. Her name is Scarlet. And she's like weird. She's like clumsy. And she like uses sticks to like hold up her hair. And she arrives and she doesn't know what art she wants to do. And that's like unheard of. Everyone arrives and knows exactly what medium they're going to focus on. So Bess helps her try a bunch of different art forms. And she keeps failing at them and making like a huge mess of these other fairy studios. And now no one else wants her around. And the art fairies are like, well, maybe if we built her her own studio, then she could hang out in there and not mess up any of our stuff. And Scarlet immediately knows like, oh, it's because they don't like me and they don't want me around and they're trying to get rid of me. And she gets all sad. And so Bess, to try and cheer her up, takes her to go collect plants to make paint. And Bess gets like stuck because it's these magical vines that she gets stuck in. And Scarlet helps her out and she's not afraid of looking silly or getting dirty. Like Scarlet falls into the mud and she doesn't care. And then Bess is like, maybe it's a good thing that she's like not self-conscious at all. And maybe she would like ceramics because she doesn't mind mud. And then Scarlet's a natural at ceramics and she's found her medium. So those are the other chapter books I was able to read. There's a couple that I couldn't find anywhere. I admittedly did not look super hard because I had already read like 20 of these. And I was like, I think it's fine if I don't read these last four or so. Then there's a category that I think of as like coffee table books for children. So I have these guys. These two are sort of like encyclopedias about the fairy world. So this one is about the books. It's in the realm of never fairies. And then this one is about the movies. It's called The World of Fairies. The one that's based on the movies has a ton of original art. And the one that's based on the books repurposes a lot from the chapter books, but still has some original stuff. 
And it's sort of like a guide to the world building and does like profiles of some of the characters. I loved those books because I love the world building. So it was nice to just have it all in one place. Another book that I have is The Hidden World of Fairies. And this is one of those books that has a lot of like interactive elements and like textures and stuff. It's supposed to be Wendy Darling's scrapbook that she made when she visited Pixie Hollow. So it's like her experience going through Pixie Hollow and she talks about all the different talents. And the book has like a little green plastic magnifying glass sort of thing. It's just like a sheet of clear plastic. And you can use it to look at all these little messages that Tinkerbell wrote in the margins. I have lost it, as is the case with a lot of books like these that have like pieces that you can take out. Some of the pieces have been lost to time, but it's a very charming little book. And then I have one that I bought while I was doing research for this video, because I saw it and I thought, that's amazing. It's Secret Fairy Homes. And let me just, it's like these giant poster size pages of all of the fairies' different living quarters, which that's one of my favorite parts is like miniature little houses with a lot of like repurposed items. And it shows the houses for a lot of the different book characters. This book is just fantastic. And then there's a couple categories of books that I did not know about at all. So apparently there was a short-lived manga series it was published by Tokyo Pop in 2007. Tokyo Pop, I think, has like a long standing deal with Disney. They did the Descendants manga. Um, this series looks very um, my first Deviant Art OC. Don't like this art style. I don't want to be mean, but I think it's horrendously ugly. <laughs> Okay, so actually I looked at some of the sample pages and I think I'm just reacting to the coloring because the actual black and white pages are much better. And then also there's five manga listed on the wiki and two of the five are in a completely different style. So three of them are adaptations of chapter books, but then one is an adaptation of a Tinkerbell movie and one of them seems completely random. So I don't really know what's going on and I don't know anything about manga, so don't listen to me. <laughs> Then there's graphic novels, and I was sort of confused at how the Tinkerbell wiki explained this, but I think there was a Disney Fairies Italian magazine that published, like, short comics about the fairies, and then those were sort of bundled together and repackaged into books of graphic novels. So each book would have, like, multiple short stories in it. I think. I think I understand that correctly. There's over 70 issues of the magazine and then 20 graphic novels. And roughly the first half of them were about the book characters before they transitioned to the movie characters. I think this art style is very cute. It's very similar to the book illustrations, but just a little bit more crisp and stylized in the way that graphic novels are. And then there was a series of books called The Never Girls. These started in 2013, a little bit after I was over fairies. And they follow four girls who travel through a portal to Pixie Hollow. And I think there's a bunch of like portal traveling back and forth, going on adventures with the fairies and stuff like that. I read the first one from the library. Shout out Libby. Um, they're not for me. As I've already mentioned, I do not care about human children interacting with fairies. But this series seems to have been pretty successful. It ran from 2013 to 2020. I don't know if they're going to make any more of them. I'm not interested in reading any more of them. But I'm sure that some people just a little bit younger than me have the same nostalgia for those books as I do for the chapter books. So that's all the books. My working title for this video is rereading all of the Disney fairy books. And perhaps that's a little bit misleading if I did not technically read all of them. But I think I read enough of them. I read all of the ones that I have, which depending on how you're counting is most of them. I originally was going to talk about all the books and all the movies and all the associated media. And I filmed a version of that video using the awful webcam on my new computer because my first video was filmed using my webcam on my old laptop, but then I got a new laptop. 
and this webcam is much worse. The computer's better, but the webcam is worse. And I also filmed it with the mic prominently in frame, despite it not actually working, because I think I had the input settings wrong, and so the audio is also terrible. So that whole version got scrapped. And while I was re-planning out making this video, I was like, let's just split it up. So I've done this video about the books, and then next I'm gonna make a video where I watch all of the movies and shorts and stuff. So if you're interested in watching that, please subscribe. And feel free to tell me in the comments if you also pronounced Ronnie's name Rainy. It can't have been that uncommon of a mistake. At least I hope. Uh, I don't know how to end a YouTube video. So, bye.